Okay, we are back now, so welcome to my channel if you're new. I'm Lizzie. We're going to do Victorian ghost stories and Oxford anthology again. We're going to hopefully today finish up the old nurse's story. Maybe not in this same video, but we're going to try to at least finish it up today within a couple more videos. So let's hop into it. The foreign musician came again next summer, but it was for the last time, for they led him such a life of jealousy and their passions that he grew weary and went away and never was heard of again. And Mrs. Maud, who had always meant to have her marriage acknowledged when her father should be dead, was left now a deserted wife whom nobody knew to have been married, with a child that she dared not own. Although she loved it to distraction, living with a father whom she feared and a sister whom she hated, when the next year passed over and the dark foreigner never came, both Mrs. Maud and Mrs. Grace grew gloomy and sad. They had a haggard look about them, though they looked handsome as ever, but by and by Mrs. Maud brightened, for her father grew more and more infirm and more than ever carried away by his music, and she and Mrs. Grace lived almost entirely apart, having separate rooms, the one on the, re one on the west side, Mrs. Maud on the east, those very rooms which were now shut up, so she thought she might have her little girl with her, and no one need ever know except those who dare not speak about it and were bound to believe that it was, as she said, a cottager's child she had taken a fancy to. All this, Dorothy said, was pretty well known. But what came afterwards, no one knew except Mrs. Grace and Mrs. Stark. And Miss Stark, who was even then her maid, and much more of a friend to her than ever her sister had been. But the servants supposed for, from words that were dropped that Mrs. Maud had triumphed over Mrs. Grace and told her that all the time the dark foreigner had been mocking her with pretend love. He was her own husband. The color left, the color left Mrs. Grace's cheeks and lips that very day forever, and she was heard to say many a time that sooner or later she will be having her revenge, and Miss Stark was forever spying about the East Rooms. One fearful night, just after the new year had come in, when the snow was laying thick and deep, and the flakes were still falling fast enough to blind anyone who might be out and abroad, there was a great and violent noise heard in the old lord's voice above all, cursing and swearing awfully in the cries of a little child, and the proud defiance of a fierce woman, and the sound of a blow, and a dead stillness, and moans and wailing dying away on the hillside. Then the old lord summoned all his servants and told them with terrible oaths that the words more terrible, that his daughter had dis disgraced herself, and that he had turned her out of doors, her and her child, and that if ever they gave her up, gave her help or food or shelter, he prayed that they might have, they might never enter heaven. And all the while, Mrs. Grace stood by him, white and still as any stone. And when he had ended, she heaved a great sigh, such as to say her work was done and her end was accomplished. But the old Lord never touched his organ again and died within the year. And no wonder, for on the morrow of that wild and fearful night the shepherds coming down the fell said found mrs maud sitting all crazy and smiling under the holly trees nursing a dead child with a terrible mark on its right shoulder but that was not what killed it said dorothy it was the frost and cold every wild creature was in its hole and every beast in its fold while the child and its mother were turned out to wonder on the fells. And now you know all, and I wonder if you are less frightened now. I was more frightened than ever, but I said I was not. I wish Mrs. Rosamond and myself well out of that dreadful house forever. 
but I would not leave her and I dared not take her away. But oh, how I lost her and guarded her. We bolted the doors shut and the window shutters fast an hour or more before dark rather than leave them open five minutes too late. But my little lady still heard the weird child crying and mourning. And not all we could do or say could keep her from wanting to go to her and let her in from the cool wind and snow. All this time, I kept away from Mrs. Furnival and Miss Stark as much as ever I could, for I feared them. I knew no good could be about them with their gray, hard faces and their dreamy eyes looking back into the ghastly years that were gone. But even in my fear, I had a kind of pity for Mrs. Furnival. At least those going down to the pit can hardly have a more hopeless look than that which was ever on her face. At least I even got so sorry for her, who never said a word but, was, but what was quite forced from her, that I prayed for her and I thought, taught Mrs. Rosamond to pray for one who had been, done a deadly sin, but often when she came to those words, she would listen and start up from her knees and say, I hear my little girl plaining and crying very sad, a letter in, or she'll, she will die. One night just after New Year's Day had come at last, and the long winter had taken a turn as I hoped. I heard the west drawing ring bell ring three times which is a signal for me. I would not leave Mrs. Rosamond alone, for all she was asleep, for the old Lord had been playing wilder than ever, and I feared lest my dear, my darling should waken to hear the spectre child see her. I knew she could not. I had fastened the windows too well for that, so I could, took her out of her bed and wrapped her up in such outer clothing as were most handy and carried her down to the drawing room where the old lady sat at their tapestry work as usual. They looked, they looked up when I came in and Miss Stark asked quite astound, why did I bring Mrs. Rosamond there out of her warm bed? I had begun to whisper because I was afraid of her being tempted out while I was away by the wild child in the snow when she stopped me short with a glance at Mrs. Furnival and said Mrs. Furnival wanted me to undo some work she had done wrong and which neither of them could see to unpick. So I laid my pretty dear on the sofa and sat down on a stool by them and hardened my heart against them as I heard the wind rising and howling. Mrs. Rosamond slept on sound for all the wind blew so and Mrs. Farnaval said never a word, nor looked around when the gusts shook the windows. All at once she started up to her full height and put up one hand as if to bid us listen. I hear voices, she said she. I hear terrible screams. I hear my father's voice. Just at that moment, the darling wakened with a sudden start. My little girl is crying. Oh, how she is crying. And she tried to get up and go to her. But she got her feet tangled in the blanket, and I caught her up, for my flesh had begun to creep at those noises which they heard, while we could catch no sound. In a minute or two, the noises came and gathered fast and filled our ears. We, too, heard voices and screams and no longer heard the winter's wind with that raged abroad. Mrs. Miss Stark looked at me, and I at her. But we dared not speak. Suddenly, Mrs. Furnival went towards the door out into the anteroom, anteroom, through the west lobby, and opened the door into the great hall. Miss Stark followed, and I durst not be left, though my heart almost stopped beating for fear. I wrapped my darling tight in my arms and went out with them in the hall. The screamings were louder than ever. They sounded to come from the east wing, nearer and nearer, close to the other, close on the other side of the locked door, locked up doors, close behind them. Then I noticed that the great bronze chandelier seemed all alight, though the hall was dim. 
and that a fire was blazing in the vast hearth place, though it gave no heat, and I said it, and I shuddered up with terror and folded my darling close to me. But as I did so, the east door shook, and she suddenly struggling to get free from me cried, Hester, I must go. My little girl is there. I hear her. She is coming. Hester, I must go. I held her tight with all my strength. With I set will, I held her. If I had died, my hands would have grasped her still. I was so resolved in my mind. Mrs. Furnival stood listening and paid no regard to my darling who had got down to the ground and whom I, upon my knees, now was holding with both my arms clasped around her neck. She still striving and crying to get free. All at once, the east door gave way with a thundering crash as if torn open in a violent passion. And there came into the that broad and mysterious light the figure of a tall old man with gray hair and gleaming eyes. He drove before him with many a relentless stressor of abhorrence, abhorrence. A stern and beautiful woman with a little child clinging to her dress. Oh, Hester, Hester, cried Mrs. Rosemont. It's the lady, the lady below the holly trees. And my little girl is with her, Hester. Hester, let me go to her. They are drawing me to them. I feel them. I feel them. I must go. Again, she was almost convulsed by efforts to get away but i held her tighter and tighter till i feared i should do her a hurt but rather that than let her go towards the terrible phantoms they passed on along towards the great hall door where the wind howled and ravened for their prey but before they reached up the lady turned and i could see that she defied the old man with a fierce and proud defiance but when she quill when she quilled, and then she threw her arms up wildly and petitiously to save her child, her little child, from a blow with his uplifted crutch. And Miss Rosamond was torn as by power stronger than mine, and writhed in her arms and sobbed, for by this time the poor darling was growing faint. They want me to go with them onto the fells. They are drawing me to them. Oh, my little girl, I would come. But cruel, wicked Hester holds me very tight. But then she saw the uplifted crutch. She swooned away, and I thank God for it. Just at this moment when the old man, the tall old man, his hair streamed as in the blast of a furnace, was going to strike the little shrieking child. Mrs. Furnival, the old woman by my side, cried out, Oh, Father, Father, spare the little innocent child. But just within, I saw, we all saw, another phantom shape itself and grow clear out of the blue in the misty light that filled that shell, the hall. We had not seen her till now, for it was another lady who stood by the old man with a look of relentless hate and triumphant scorn. That figure was very beautiful to look upon with a soft white hat drawn down over the proud brows and a red and curling lip. It was the dress in an open robe of blue satin. I had seen the figure before. It was the likeness of Mrs. Furnival in her youth, and the terrible phantom moved on regardless of old Mrs. Furnival's wild entreaty. And the uplifted crutch fell on the right shoulder of the little child, and the younger sister looked on stony and deadly serene but at that moment the dim lights and the fire that gave no heat went out of themselves and mrs furnival lay on her feet stricken down by the palsy death stricken yes she was carried to her bed that night never to rise again she lay with her face to the wall muttering low but muttering away alas alas what is done in youth could never be undone in age what is done in youth can never be done undone in age. Well, that's the last of it. So we're going to stop there. Next, I'm going to read the next story. It's called An Account of Some Strange Disturbance in Angier Street. <laughs>